Hello, and welcome back to The Jacobin Show. You may have noticed I'm not here with Paul Prescott or Ariella Thornhill tonight. Instead, we've got young Kale, <laughs> who's similarly confused about why the other two co-hosts aren't here. Yeah, I was not expecting to be on screen right now. I was kind of hoping that this would be Paul, and I'm thoroughly disappointed that it's me again. I don't even I don't know what we're doing, but I'm going to try my best, and uh, I I will promise you the, the best I can do tonight, and I will learn and do a growth. Uh, you take know. responsibility and accountability. I'm going to take some accountability tonight for my uh, for my really short my big shortcoming of not uh, being Paul. Being, yeah, being Paul, really. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, I hope Paul uh, and Ariella don't mind me mentioning this, but Paul is, as you all know, a high school teacher, and he's actually at his students' graduation tonight. Uh, so that's why his wonderful face isn't on. Um, I don't know if we have said this before, but Ariella is, we have, Ari Ariella is starting her maternity leave. Uh, she's obviously about to have a baby. It hasn't happened yet, but, you know, we wish her the best and it is impending. So stay tuned for more updates. I have requested that she open up a, a stream link in the hospital, but I was told that that's not appropriate and we're not gonna do that folks. Yeah, we're so. not gonna be streaming that live birth, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, you'll just have to wait for future updates. Um, but actually, Kale, I, I am really glad that you're on tonight because one of the things that I wanted to talk about was the New York mayoral race, uh, which has sort of gone in a couple different interesting directions. Um, I'm no longer a resident of New York, but you are. Uh, and there's, there's one candidate in particular that I think we're going to kind of zero in on uh, because it relates to a lot of the themes that we'll be talking about with Ben Fong and Melissa Nascheck, who are coming on a little later to talk about NGO is and the rise of the nonprofit sector. Um, and, and we'll get to her, we'll get to the candidate, that candidate in a second. Uh, but first, let's go through the roster of the New York mayoral candidates because there's like 50,000, right? Here yeah. they all are. Um, there's probably even more that like didn't make it onto this collage. Uh, there's of course on the Republican side, guardian angel Curtis Sliwa, who's running on like a law and order on steroids uh, platform. Um, but these are all the democratic, oh no, there he is, there he is, right? I see him in his red beret. Okay, so Kale, I think, I think this you is everyone. get all of them. Yeah, yeah this, this is, is everyone. All, this is everyone, okay. Um, but for the democratic candidates in particular, um, the front runner, of course, is Eric Adams, who's the Brooklyn Borough president. Uh, he's also a former NYPD officer. And, you know, subsequently, his platform has kind of been this one note law and order uh, drumbeat, right? Um, I should mention, he he also famously said a couple years ago uh, that non-native New Yorkers should, quote, go back to where you came from, uh, go back to Iowa, go back to Ohio. So <laughs> that's the that's the number one guy so far. Uh, close on his heels is, of course, Andrew Yang. We all know what Yang from the 2020 uh, Democratic primaries. Yang is a uh, like pretty weird kind of technocratic. Um, I feel like his vision for the city is like a cross between Blade Runner and an Amazon warehouse where everybody gets like a $6 universal basic income every month. Um, Kale, do you have anything to add about Yang? Yeah, but it's gonna be really cool guys because math yeah. is cool and, <laughs> and- Like we all have good attitudes. I, I think you're you're right that he's kind of like, he's the weird vote that mm -hmm. Adams is, is kind of, uh, within the democratic spectrum, Adams is the right, right right wing candidate um what we'll get into in a moment is that there really isn't a left wing candidate and there's a number of people who've kind of been jockeying for that spot mm -hmm. uh and so there's some that are kind of warren democrats and then there really isn't like a true bernie crat in the race uh whereas yeah, so yeah, let's so let's let's run through a few of the others right because then there's kath Catherine, Catherine Garcia, who I had not heard of until the New York Times endorsed her, which given the history of the New York Times endorsements is probably the kiss of death. Uh, so we, we won't spend too much time on that. Scott Stringer was the sort of progressive front runner at the beginning. Um, I think he got a lot of, you know, high profile progressive endorsements, such as from the Working Families Party and the Sunrise Movement. But I think all of those organizations dropped him like a hot potato when allegations of sexual assault came out against him. Uh, but he is still in the race. He's just kind of a non-entity. Um, 
he remains yeah. probably the most viable of the of the left. Um, although actually, it, it seems like things are shaking up kind of in the last uh, few hours, that are the last few minutes. I'm getting immediate updates right now, but um, that Wiley has kind of started to overtake uh, Stringer. Okay. But, um, okay. So it, actually, let's let's talk about Wiley, right? Because she was a member of Bill De Blasio's administration. Um, I think her most recent scandal is, you know, she has also been trying to position herself as a progressive. And following from that, uh, one of her big policy planks was to defund the NYPD by one billion dollars. Uh, but it recently it recently came out in the news that you know it's not a shocker. She lives in a pretty wealthy neighborhood. They actually have a private security patrol. And you know when she was confronted with this fact, she kind of hemmed and hawed and was like, "Well, like I don't. I mean, I personally like don't want to pay for it. My husband does because he was mugged last year, and there's a lot of trauma. And who am I to say that you know you like who am who am I to tell tell him what to do? Um, and uh, you know, kind of equivocated and and tried to make it clear that she didn't support the private security, but the fact remains that her neighborhood has one, right? And so mm -hmm. I think that that tension between her stated policies and what she benefits from personally, it, it, it really comes off as like police for me, but not for thee. Um, so, so that's Maya Wiley. Um, and then uh, is there anyone we're leaving out? I mean, I know that there's like a ton of others, but uh, who else? Well, we should probably just go to the, uh... <laughs> the woman of the hour, I suppose, uh, which is Daya Morales. Um, this is, I mean, it's been covered in plenty of other venues, um, including Jacobin. We have a number of really good articles by Ross Barkin, um, and we're going to mention Ross again in a moment. Uh, but the Morales campaign uh, today uh, fired 45 staffers over legal concerns. Um, and uh, it's it's effectively, this is game over, more or less, um, even though the part of the thing about this mayoral, mayoral election that makes it kind of strange is the fact that it's a ranked choice vote election, meaning that uh, when someone goes into the, the ballot booth, they are going to be selecting five different candidates and ranking them in an order. And then if their first choice doesn't make it, their vote will now be transferred to their second choice. And if the second choice doesn't make it, it will be transferred over and so on. And so it, it gives the impression that um, even though uh, you know, someone might be polling at a couple points, they are maybe still viable. Um, I'm somewhat suspect of that. My sense is that, especially given the way that, uh, given the fact that almost all of their politics in America are first past the post, meaning mm -hmm. um, it basically whoever just gets, uh, you know, 51% uh, or, you know, 50 plus 1% ends up uh, winning. My sense is that people, even if they put some kind of uh, some of the smaller ranking candidates up first, uh, maybe even second, they're most likely going to say, okay, but who's actually viable? Who, right. who, I'm, I'm still going to pick a lesser evil candidate kind of right. thing. So, By the way, I just want to say really quickly, on the subject of ranked choice voting, this is the first year that New York is doing this. Um, and I I think it's pretty ironic because when I was still in New York, you know, last month, uh, I was like, all of these candidates are like equally bad to me, <laughs> like it, all in different ways, of course, you know, but I like couldn't decide who I would even rank first out of all of them. We're, and part we, of the part of the problem, which we're going to talk about, is that there was really no left candidate in the race. Right. We're in WhatsApp chats where we have friends of ours that are just all day long, like, uh, uh, OK, we're going to move this candidate up and this candidate down and this. And it's it's like it's so frustrating because we hate all of them. <laughs> like this is this is such a disappointing, um, especially given the kind of the momentous political changes that have happened in this country in the last like six or seven years, that there really isn't a left wing candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's somewhat of kind of an organizational failure that the left was not able to actually find someone. Um, but the part of the other problem is that there is someone who kind of has been uh, presenting themselves as the left wing candidate. Um, and it's not really a fair uh, characterization at all. Um, and so we should we should get right into that, I suppose. Yeah, let's do it. So Diane Morales, of course, the candidate that we just mentioned, who looks like she's about to shutter her campaign. Um, 
If you've been following the New York mayoral race, you've probably heard a little bit about the kind of kerfuffle that her campaign has been going through. Uh, I think the big story that ended up in the New York Times and other mainstream outlets was that there was a pretty public staff revolt, right? Uh, so a bunch of staffers, you know, released public statements and ended up quitting, saying that black and brown staffers weren't treated fairly, that there was, you know, bad working conditions and a kind of culture of toxicity and abuse. And the Morales campaign kind of fired back uh, at them. And, and this sort of got the attention of a lot of, you know, conservative commentators and, and just people who are kind of media watchers, because the language on both sides of the fight, by which I mean the staffers and also the Morales campaign was just rife with the most like borderline parody social justice language imaginable, right? So I think that we actually have an example of a statement from Diane Morales. Um, and and Kale's going to do a dramatic reading, actually, because it's yeah. a really good statement. I was hoping that one of my better actor friends could do this, but I'm going to I'm going to do a dramatic reading. This is um, don't worry if you can't really see it. I'm going to read off um, part of her statement uh, where she says that we believe in transformative justice in our city and on this campaign. And as such, we are taking the necessary steps to address harm caused by certain staff on our campaign and to build accountability. And we'll continue to work towards building a movement of dignity, care and solidarity. That process began last night when I sat with the campaign staff, many of whom I consider family, for hours to listen to the concerns on a myriad of issues. And during that meeting, I accepted accountability in my role as the head of the campaign that allowed for this harm to occur. <laughs> I mean, I think that if you have spent any time on the left or, you know, relatedly in nonprofit circles, you're probably familiar with all of those buzzwords. But at the end of the day, what does that mean? It means nothing. Like that was just a word salad of the of, of all of the various different, you know, social justice words of uh, trauma, harm, accountability kind of jumbled together. I mean, it's it's so I mean, the part of the thing that's so like disappointing and frustrating about how, you know, we're going to keep getting into this, but like how the left uses this language. Um, and it's not, it's not all of the left, obviously, but there's like a chunk of the activist left that uses this kind of language. And then it like greatly reduces the efficacy of mm -hmm. these, of these words and these meanings like that actually, obviously, like I think a, a key uh, cornerstone of left politics is accountability that mm -hmm. like we would want uh, political, or we want politicians within a political institution or a party that have some kind of democratic accountability, uh, perhaps a recall mechanism or something, so mm -hmm. that their political actions are largely determined by uh, the membership, by and ideally membership being also as democratic as possible. Yeah, so, I think I think the exact same thing has happened with the word representation, where right. we on the left want representation by which, again, we want our elected officials to actually represent our political views and our political programs. And as you said, we want them to be accountable to us, the people. But representation has obviously turned into this kind of like floating buzzword where it often means, quote, people who look like me, right, who very often do not represent your interests. Um, so that's another that's another way I think you know just just going off what you said that these words which I think at one point maybe did have some kind of uh, stronger meaning or connection to the left have just become completely evacuated. Um, and actually, let's go back to Diane Morales's statement because I wanna read the first line. So she writes uh, in, in the first line of her statement, traditional political spaces have long disenfranchised black and brown people on campaigns. Our campaign works to intentionally center the voices of those who are excluded from politics. And we acknowledge that mistakes have been made in attempts to do this. Um, uh, so again, you know, this is very common language that you would hear on the left, um, you know, uh, spaces, uh, uh, let's see, what else? Um, disenfranchised black and brown people, um, intentionally center. I mean, again, this is kind of the language of of the left in many ways. Uh, and I think I think the question is, what does it actually mean? Or like when it's so readily available or like so easily commandeered by a candidate like this, what does it mean? Um, and, you know, just to go back to Diane Morales and whether she actually is a candidate of the left. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about how her campaign sort of imploded because of this staff revolt. But I think that there are also um, 
quite frankly, I think there are more sort of important aspects of the campaign to focus on, which is that number one, she has very deep charter school ties. Uh, I recommend again, Ross Barkin's newsletter. Uh, he's a columnist for Jacobin, but he also has an independent newsletter, which kind of covers New York City politics. And he's really sort of, uh, broken that out, broken out her ties to charter schools. She actually founded a charter school, which he points out she refers to as a public school on her website. Um, she is a landlord. She, you know, owns a $2 million brownstone in Bed-Stuy uh, and obviously collects rents, rent from tenants. Um, what else? She is, she is the executive director of a nonprofit, which actually is part of a nonprofit real estate developer, which is known for evicting people. So this is not really a candidate that, uh, all I'm the, sorry. This is, this is just an intersectional agenda, Jen. That's right, right, exactly. You just don't exactly. understand the intersections of how she's made a career out of like exploiting people. <laughs> this is directly from her website. Um, her website, if you go to it, looks like any social justice nonprofit website. It's colorful. It has all the right words like intersectionality agenda. Um, you know, she, I mean, if you look at the program that she's, you know, she has on her website that she says she wants to put forward, there are some things on there that I think are good. Like she's called for a municipal green jobs guarantee. I think that's good. Um, she has talked about a citywide uh, rent moratorium, um, but I think she's probably most famous for her call to defund the police. She was really the only candidate in the race for a while that, you know, was said explicitly, I want to defund the police. She wants to remove $3 billion from the NYPD. Um, and leading on her homepage is a video of her talking about that. So let's roll that. As a lifelong New Yorker, a mom, and as someone who has worked my entire career to increase access to opportunity for communities of color, I've been so proud to be a part of our city's calls for justice around systemic racism. Now's the time for us to change the broken systems we have lived with all of our lives. We can make history in this extraordinary moment. We are ready to create a new social justice compact where every New Yorker has an opportunity to succeed and thrive. But that requires sustained energy, focused purpose, and honest, bold leadership. I've already been the first mayoral candidate to join with countless others in calling for divesting resources from the police and investing them in the people. I am committed to putting an end to the racist and oppressive systems that are failing all of us. But that's just a start. As we lead, so shall others follow. We are New Yorkers. We can do this. Together. So again, I just... just I love the stock music, just like the, the violin that's getting more and more intense. Soaring violins. Uh favorite of the political ad <laughs> repertoire. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but again, you know, there there is all of this radical rhetoric, which of course contrasts pretty jarringly with her actual record and her actual background. Um, and so again, you know, I, I recommend this Ross Barkin piece uh, where he talks about kind of her ties to these more unsavory elements of the city. Uh, and, and he says something like, uh, we have a quote from him here. Let me pull it up. So he says, the fundamental problem of Morales' candidacy is that almost nothing in her professional history suggested she cared about being any kind of radical leftist or even an ordinary progressive volunteering for worthy campaigns and causes. And I think that he's right about that. I think that that is 100% true. But mm -hmm. that said, like, I also think something that's interesting about kind of this whole phenomenon is that Diane Morales employing all of this social justice rhetoric, you know, the buzzwords that we kind of hit on a few moments ago. Um, I don't think that there's actually as much of a tension uh, between her background and between that language, right? Like we've come to think of this language as like progressive language or the language of the left. Um, and in some cases it is. Um, and actually I think when Ben and Melissa come on, like they'll talk a little bit more about that uh, and how it relates to the rise of the nonprofit sector. Um, but, but, you know, Diane Morales is from a nonprofit background. She's college educated. She is professional class. And this is the language of that milieu. Right. Well, there's this contradiction where, right, because the language, it can be used by anyone. Mm -hmm. Some of a good chunk of her platform, you would say like, yeah, this is redistributive. This is uh, egalitarian. Like there's aspects of it that you would want to support. And then when you look at the polling and she's at 5% 
uh, that she's not really a viable contender. I don't have the, there's another poll um, on like the second choice and she's also very low on the second choice, meaning mm -hmm. no chance at all. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and she has, I mean, she, you know, didn't get the DSA endorsement. She didn't get, uh, you know, really many, she didn't really get any progressive endorsements to begin with. Um, in fact, a lot of her messaging up front, uh, her, one of her t-shirts that went viral uh, that says, she is viable if you vote for her, which is the, that was the big fuck you slogan of the Elizabeth Warren campaign on Super yep. Tuesday in 2020. Mm -hmm. That's what she ran. That's on her, that's still on her website. I took this, the screenshot today. You can buy that viable t-shirt if you want. It's a nice little souvenir before it goes under. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, get in quick. <laughs> um, but the thing is that like when, so in that same poll that I, I was looking at a moment ago, when you actually look at the issues that matter to New Yorkers that are planning to vote right now, this is with likely voters, 46% of them say that crime or violence is their number one issue, uh, followed by affordable housing, followed by COVID. But um, in housing is, uh, when you look at the likely voters, housing is, is basically tied with crime. Mm -hmm. um, but in total people that were surveyed, uh, crime is, is kind of in a league of its own as the issue that most New Yorkers are thinking about. I think in that same poll, it was something like 70%, I had it written down, it's not in front of me now. Something like 70% of the people polled said that they either strongly or somewhat support increasing the number of NYPD officers on the streets mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So more or less, I mean, the, the this is an election on crime and policing and the left doesn't have a candidate in, in this yeah. election. The, the, and it's kind of also just, it's symbolic of, I mean, it's not symbolic. It's literally, it's literally the problem where like the left has been unable to put forward uh, some kind of response to crime and to policing that is politically appealing to people. Mm -hmm. um, that you can get 70% of people in New York. New York has like, like the NYPD is an army. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we see them everywhere. Like the fact that 70% of people are saying they want more policing because there are such massive social problems uh, in, in New York right now. Uh, and they do not, there is no alternative of like, well, maybe we should have, uh, an expansion of public goods that actually deal with social problems in a way that is again, you know, more to working class people's benefits that ideally is, is more democratic. That's not, we don't have that option being put forward in any, I mean, it, people are saying that obviously, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not reaching people. Right. Um, and then, the person who ends up being understood socially as the left candidate is just mired in like social justice, campus activist language. Mm -hmm. uh, and it ends up hurting our overall project mm -hmm. that this person ends up uh, being the left candidate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let, let's take a minute before we bring on Ben and Melissa to kind of look at that social justice language. I mean, you know, we, we talked a little bit about it already, um, but I want to, I want to bring up some points in particular and, and, you know, number one is that it's a very small elite of people who use this language. Like, I'm sorry to say, this is language that dominates, that is predominantly used, you know, on college campuses, university campuses, um, in the nonprofit sector, which obviously we'll talk with Ben and Melissa about in a bit. Uh, and, you know, in the media, in professional activist sphere spheres. And I think what's interesting about a lot of this language is it uh, the, its proponents often say, like, this is this is the language we use now because it's more inclusive, right? So uh, a, a kind of classic example is Latinx, which, by the way, I didn't know how to pronounce until I worked for a nonprofit a few years ago. But anyway, that's L A T I N X. Um, but we have polling from the pre from the Pew Research Center that actually shows that only three percent of Latino adults who were surveyed use Latinx, and actually 76%, AKA the overwhelming majority of Latino adults have never even heard of the term, right? So I think when, you know, the argument is made that these terms are more inclusive, the question is like, to who? Right. Uh, like, if the vast majority of people don't use this term, how can they be inclusive? Well, I mean, that poll, so that, to give them the benefit of the doubt, the poll was done in, at the end of 2019, perhaps the numbers have shifted slightly, but I think mm -hmm. what's more significant is that of the people that actually know the term, the vast majority of them don't like it and don't use it. So like, what is the, what, what is the goal of this as right. like, as a political ambition, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think one of the things is that like, basically since the, since the early seventies, when like 
the left and the labor movement uh, basically were defeated in, in being able to push for any kind of like actual um, like kind of public goods or social like good social transformations to the benefit of working people. Uh, the only thing that's that's continued to move kind of towards the left or in a left wing direction has been the language that we use to talk about oppression and right. domination and exploitation, all these things. Uh, and so, you know, some of those, you know, linguistic changes uh, and terminological changes have been useful and good. I mean, obviously, like a lot of like some of that is is really good and useful, but it doesn't actually like relate to what people are actually going through. It's right. not connecting to an actual political project. And so mm -hmm. people, I think rightfully, uh, like it's, you can understand why people would reject uh, mm -hmm. some of this language or a lot of the language or just kind mm -hmm. of P PC culture, any of these things, because it's, um, because the people that it really genuinely is connected to are the professionals that have been, relatively speaking, the beneficiaries of kind of the, transformations in global capitalism mm -hmm, over the last mm -hmm. 30, 40 years, that right. they've been along for the ride. They got, you know, less and less, but they got a lot of the goodies out of out of this. Uh, and, uh, you know, and all the billionaires are, are hidden. They don't go on camera. You don't actually see the ruling class on TV. Um, but like all of these professional people that, you know, ended up moving with all this language, they're the ones associated with it. And so it then just, it then it ends up reeking of, uh, of a class politics. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think even, right. And I think even in the instances where, you know, best case scenario, this language is not alienating. Um, I, I still think that it's not clear what use it does serve. Right. And I'll just give like an anecdotal example, uh, which is that for a long time, my mom, who is, you know, an immigrant and who speaks English as a third language, like use the term oriental, like much like way past the date after which like that was an acceptable thing to say. Um, and, you know, so like at a certain point, I'd be like, oh, mom, like we say Asian American now, you know, and obviously she wasn't using the term oriental as a slur or anything. She just like that was when she immigrated to the US, that was like a term that was more kind of common, I guess. And for her, you know, oriental isn't it's like not actually that different from A A P I. N H I I or like whatever the like you okay? <laughs> no, not really. Um, do you know about this though? There's been more letters added on to A A P I. I, I I'm You're not, out of the loop, Kale. I'm extremely out of the loop, Kale. Uh, I will hold you to accountability. I'm doing a white uh, no, supremacy. But, okay, I'm doing a nationalism. I'm yeah. doing a no growth. Yeah. All right, so my point with this anecdote is this. Obviously, we don't say Oriental anymore for pretty good reasons. Those reasons being that, you know, that was a term that is highly outdated because it kind of originates from this period of like imperial expansion when, you know, uh, uh, Europeans sort of divided the world into the Occident and the Orient, you know? Yeah. So it's reactionary insofar as it harkens back to an understanding of the world that we no longer have. Like all well and good and fair. And by the way, obviously my mom no longer uses that term. Right, but and just like evil, time, like an evil political regime. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, the, the evil political political regime over there. Yeah. yeah. So obviously there's a good reason not to use that term anymore. And, you know, it's good that the language has evolved and it's not hard to get on board with language evolving. Mm -hmm. Now, all that said, there isn't anything necessarily more progressive about a string of acronyms uh, uh, to somebody who is literally in that group, you know? So that's the mm -hmm. only point that I wanted to make. I, I don't feel like I have the right to comment on this point. <laughs> so with that being said, I think we should bring on our guests. Let's do it. <laughs> um, so let's bring on uh, Ben Fong, who is a professor at Arizona State University, and Melissa Nazchek, who is an, a political organizer and a writer, a soon to be prolific writer in Philadelphia. Um, two good friends of the show. Uh, you're both muted on me yourselves. Um, good to see you. How are you guys doing? Good. Uh, thanks so much for having us. Yeah, we're happy really to have you. Uh, Kale, you didn't even mention their Catalyst article, NGOism and the <laughs> Politics of the Third Sector. <laughs> uh, this is why they're on the show. Uh, it's a really great article. I encourage you all to check it out in Catalyst. Um, and, you know, we have been talking a little bit about kind of 
the nonprofit sector. And um, in our opening segment, we focused a lot on language, but I think where I wanna start with you guys is, um, I assume that a lot of people know what a nonprofit is or are sort of familiar with, uh, you know, the nonprofit sector at large. Um, but maybe let's just start by giving by with with a definition. So so what is an NGO and how ubiquitous are they right now? Um, maybe, Melissa, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so like you said, I, I think there is kind of a degree of common sense with a nonprofit. Um, you know, it's it's defined by um, a different funding structure to perpetuate their organization. So if you think of a typical for-profit corporation, they're expected to take an investment, make a product, earn a profit, and then continue to persist off of reinvesting their own profits from what they make. In contrast, a nonprofit is not necessarily expected to exist uh, by continuing to you know, sell its own good. Nonprofits, in theory, are supposed to be based off of providing a social good that's not necessarily expected to generate a profit for many reasons. I think most commonly because they're fulfilling a social need that is inherently unprofitable and so therefore unattractive for corporations to come in and provide a good or service in that field. Mm -hmm. So nonprofits are, are persisting off of a funding structure that depends on a combination of philanthropic donations from you know, primarily the middle class and the wealthy uh, from government funding, and then increasingly under neoliberalism from these kind of market-like mechanisms that, that mimic what for-profit co corporations do in selling a good and then depending on consumers to purchase that good, um, but, but ultimately in a, in a slightly different relationship because there's still, there's still no expectation that ultimately a nonprofit will be able to completely support itself by selling its own services and goods. Mm -hmm. And just Thank a small you. addition to that, um, we offer some data in the article illustrating the huge um, growth in nonprofit and foundation assets, as well as uh, just the proliferation of uh, third sector entities more, more generally. Um, but it's a huge part of the economy. It's like five to 6% of GDP and uh, it employs about 10% of the American workforce. So it's a pretty big sector. Right. We actually, I have um, one of the figures from the piece on the index of state and local government employment and public welfare versus the private organizations and um, kind of how that's split off uh, beginning, uh, at least from this data, like the, it looks like the beginning of the 70s. Um, and uh, so maybe, so I guess the, the question then is like, what, how did we get here? What are the historic factors that led to the rise of the nonprofit sector? Uh, and then why did um, why did like the unique structure of the American welfare state lead uh, to this boom uh, in NGOs? Yeah, just I mean, just quickly about that graph that you just showed. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time when we published it, but that ended in 1995, and mm. I assume 1996. That's welfare reform. Uh, that mm, split right. grows even more dramatic. Um, but to answer the question about the history, um, you know, overall the story that we tell in the article. Um, fits into, you know, a story that I think is pretty well known to Jacobin readers, which is about the, the, the decline of um, working class associational capacity beginning around the 60s. And, um, you know, I mean, today the workforce is pretty poorly unionized. I think it's 10 percent and that's uh, buoyed by public sector unionization. Um, and not so long ago, um, you know, a third of the American workforce was unionized. And those mm -hmm. unions used to um, be uh, major forces in fighting inequality and in uh, you know fighting for social justice more generally. Um, it, also not to be forgotten are the sort of large mass membership organizations um, like uh, the American Legion, you know, Freemasons, Elks. Um, I mean, these were far from uh, progressive organizations by any means, um, but they were actual membership organizations and they were, um, responsive uh, to the will of their members and they uh, they did political work and they influenced our politics. And then um, around the beginning of the 60s, uh, you see these organizations start to decline in in size, but more important in, uh, more importantly in power. 
Mm -hmm. And um, I think nonprofits really step into that space. They step in where unions and mass membership organizations used to be. And uh, that has dire consequences for our politics. Um, you know, um, uh, these the, the sort of advocacy nonprofits that have taken the place of uh, the old associations, they are uh, markedly more hier hierarchical, they're more top down, uh, they tend to be uh, dominated by professional class staffers, um, and they really only interact with their memberships uh, insofar as they're like a mailing list, you know, there's, there's very little um, democratic debate within uh, these nonprofits, and it's much more uh, staff driven. And because it's staff driven, it's also funder driven. Um, and so you just see a lot of um, the, the, the nonprofits are really insulated from uh, the people that they supposedly represent. So I guess to continue from that, you know, the time period that you're talking about where we kind of see the start of the rise of the nonprofits is also the time period when you have kind of this college educated um, white collar, I guess, professional managerial class workforce sort of starting to rise as well. Are the two connected in any way or is that just a coincidence? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's definitely a connection there. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that you know, NGOs are themselves or, or the third sector is responsible by itself for um, the professional middle class takeover of, you know, of the left and, and of political advocacy. But I think without a doubt, as, as the professional middle class is gaining political power, they're using NGOs as vehicles to perpetuate their agenda. Um, and these are institutions that are controlled and run by the professional middle class. And, and I think, you know, in this, in this instance, the war on poverty is really instructive because what you see in the 60s with the war on poverty is that, you know, Johnson declares that we need these really ambitious initiatives. We need to go into impoverished communities and figure out how to root out you know, this, this systemic issue. Um, and the vehicles that ultimately the war on poverty legislation, the Economic Opportunity Act relies on are NGOs, which are run by professional middle-class staff. Right, and so just just for clarification, I suppose, um, you're, because as Ben also mentioned, the um, this is also from the, the piece, this is uh, union membership in millions as a percentage of the labor force. And you can clearly see uh, union membership has uh, dipped so far. It's actually now, um, it, it was at its height, a little over 30%. Now it's, um, you know, uh, this is in 2006 actually. So it's lower than 12%, but um, it would be, for clarification, it would be too strong of an argument to say that uh, the NGOs cause the the collapse of the labor movement and of uh, and of unions generally, right? That it's it's not it's not that um, this was the cause. It was uh, more of there was other reasons why the labor movement collapses, and then this kind of swoops in. It, it's um, as capitalism is transforming, and you do get all these middle class people. Uh, this is where a lot of them end up. Is that fair or? I think that that's right. I mean, there can be an, there can be a tendency to overemphasize the role of um, NGOs and I guess the professional managerial class more more generally. And um, I mean, on, on the issue of uh, you know just just how intentional this was on uh, you know the part of uh, professional class interests, I guess I would emphasize more the structure of, of nonprofits than mm -hmm. um, the, the the particular people running them. Um, so you know you can have professional class staffers in mass membership organizations like unions or the American Legion or, or whatever, and uh, if they are uh, responsive to the will of the membership, then even if they bring their own set of biases and interests to the organization they're going to be forced to represent interests that are not their own. And that I think is a dynamic that we ought to, to, to encourage. Um, in the case of uh, nonprofit advocacy organizations, again, um, oftentimes these nonprofits will have huge mailing lists and they will call those mailing lists their membership, but they won't really have much interaction with their, with their supposed members beyond that. And as a result, because they aren't actually interacting with the people that they supposedly represent, 
um, they're just insulated from uh, the concerns of everyday people. Uh, and they're much more influenced by um, their their funders. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I would stress that it's more of, uh, it, it's less, uh, you know, uh, professional class machination than it is uh, just sort of the insulation within nonprofits. So let's talk about that kind of structural bind that nonprofits or like the third sector more generally um, is in. Um, can you can you lay out why uh, the kind of third sector approach to solving social problems can never sufficiently challenge capital? Um, and then following from that, uh, you you guys have a term in your article, NGOism. Talk about that. Yeah, so uh, I'll start by addressing the, the question of structural constraints. So what we what we try to emphasize is that the structural constraints in NGOs, um, rather than being derived from the, you know, the state, from the tax structure that NGOs are organized under, most people, when they hear NGOs, think of the 501c3 um, tax exempt status. Um, rather, what provides those structural constraints is the source of funding that NGOs rely on in order to continue to exist. Um, and I think the biggest surprise for us as we dug more into the funding was to realize that actually the government is the far and away the biggest funder of nonprofit activity. Um, and you know, part of this is a historical story about the fact that NGOs start to rise as neoliberalism is instituted and the social welfare state in America starts to devolve and become more privatized. Um, but NGOs are extremely reliant on state funding and basically could not persist as a sector without government funding. Um, and that comes with a number of different constraints. First of all, um, it means that they're susceptible to all of the same forces that are tearing down the social welfare state under neoliberalism. So NGOs are forced to compete for social welfare funds to continue their services that become more and more scarce, forcing them into a more and more competitive environment where, where they have to you know, compete with other NGOs in order to secure government funding that's crucial for their survival. Um, and then the further, I, I think probably the more, um, you know, not interesting, but but the thing that really ultimately makes nonprofits subject to the whims of the profit motive and to capital is the fact that government funding is really only given to provide social welfare services. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not really given to engage in political advocacy. Uh, and if nonprofits do want to engage in political advocacy, they have to go to the private sector to obtain that funding. Mm -hmm. And that that can come from a number of sources that can come from aggregated individual donations that can come from major foundations that can come from corporations. But what it means is that ultimately their ability to have any kind of political agenda and to perform any kind of political advocacy is dependent on private funding. And the largest sources of private funding come from the wealthiest people in society who mm -hmm. don't want to have anything happen that will at all threaten their ability to accumulate and to make a profit. And so it puts nonprofits in this position where they're competing for these increasingly scarce funds. And then they're politically completely handicapped from actually engaging in any advocacy that would shore up their own, abil their own financial security. So they're really, they're put in this really, you know, there's no way out of this situation um, because governments will not, as a result of um, some of the reforms that we talk about, governments will not fund nonprofits to change the government. <laughs> right. So I, I think even the best way to, to sort of envision what nonprofit sector is, is that it carries out the functions of what the government ought to to provide, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but with less funding and in such a way that nonprofits are forced to be uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurial, which in other words means that they're dependent upon private interests. So it's a form of executing what ought to be government function, but in mm -hmm. such a way that private interests can sort of dictate the terms. Right, so yeah, right. There's There are people that are in these organizations, obviously, who have really good intentions that a lot of people probably get into this work because they actually do care about public bads, that they want better outcomes uh, for social problems. Uh, and then they just 
they're they're unable to because of the structure of the of, of what they're in. It almost it seems like we if only we had somewhere to put them in the state where they could effectively do that work. They're like maybe like the people are there clearly. If only we had the the right build out of I don't know maybe welfare the welfare state. And <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting too is that when you when you look at the New Deal many of the New Deal programs explicitly mandated that funds had to go to other public institutions. And primarily, um, you know, for, for a combination of reasons, um, some would say because the federal government was too weak at the time, but most of those funds wound up going to the states. But that was actually how we built up any kind of state capacity to administer social programs. And I think this is why the, the 60s is such a watershed decade because it just opens the floodgates to instead of funding and building public institutions to giving this money essentially to private actors. Um, and, you know, that dynamic just continues to perpetuate itself because that agenda is compatible with both liberal ideas about the welfare state and very conservative ideas about the welfare state, mm -hmm. um, particularly conservatives concerns that you know, the, the big government setting setting universal standards would somehow not be sensitive to local concerns and instead create people who are dependent on the welfare state. And I think that's what's tricky about NGOs is that, you know, everyone likes them. Hmm. <laughs> and I think at this point, it's beyond just an agenda. I mean, on both sides of the aisle, there are, there are just material interests at, at work. Um, you know, there are a lot of these private and public private hybrid organizations that are wanting to get their beaks wet on any government spending. And, you know, if you imagine the government is like a dying, suffering animal, then, you know, you've got all these parasites on it. And anytime you inject cash into it, all the parasites are just going to suck it up. And so, so right now, I mean, part of the problem is that we're spending a lot of money, which is great. It's a nice turn. Um, but without fixing that structural problem, um, we're not going to see the kinds of like the emergence of like New Deal programs, for instance, mm -hmm. like without taking on the private interests at work that are, you know, leeching on the state. So let's go back to the question then of this phrase NGOism, right? Um, how do these construction, how do these structural constraints sort of produce the phenomenon that you guys call NGOism? And, and how does that spread to the rest of the left? Um, I could take that. Uh, I think so. In the article, we lay out three uh, features of NGOism: uh, that it's technocratic, that it's service oriented, and that it is focused on the community. And um, where we get those from are, uh, you know, it's it's related to the structural constraints that we just talked about. So, um, given the structural constraints on nonprofits, they are um, they are incentivized to come up with modes of solving social problems that systematically avoid taking on the profit motive, right? And this, this makes sense in the case of a lot of nonprofits in terms of their immediate self-interest. Like if you're running a nonprofit hospital, it doesn't make sense to piss off your funders by engaging in political advocacy that might make them mad for whatever reason. Um, so it makes sense within a certain context, but I think the problem that, uh, and I, I can return to those three features in a second, but. The, the, the issue that we're concerned with for the left is that, um, you know, the genies escaped the bottle. Uh, this, this mode of solving social problems that avoids taking on the profit motive, um, it's almost seen as common sense by uh, a, a lot of people who aren't necessarily even involved in the NGO world. And I think to some extent that's not so surprising. I mean, the last, uh, you know, the, the, the current generation of activists uh, young activists grew up in a world that was um, carefully curated by foundations and nonprofits. I mean, they funded the work of college professors. They trained campus uh, advocacy organizations. Uh, they they wrote our textbooks in school, um, and so that you know activists would come to political spaces and they would want to be you know do goodery and um, technocratic and avoid debates and focus on the community. I don't think none of any of that is especially surprising given. Um, the generational shift, you know, people who uh, at one point would have joined the Communist Party uh, today are volunteering for nonprofits. And I think that leads to a kind of common sense uh, that's very pernicious within the left. 
There we go. Um, so, yeah, that's that was one of the things I was struck by reading the piece is just how ubiquitous, like they've designed the world that we live in today. <laughs> that it's it like it again. You should, everyone could read the piece; it's really good. But um, you you realize that it's just it's like it's in the blood of our society, like in kind of a very metaphysical metaphysical sense of just like all the infrastructure in the last 30, 40 years was not carried out by the welfare state. It was by these private companies. I mean, this is this is what we talk about when we're talking about the privatization that occurs under neoliberalism. But I wanted to um, switch gears a little bit to something that we were talking about earlier when I was being really unwoke about language. Um, why, why do the NGOs love community? Like in the in the statement that I read earlier from Diane Morales, she talks about how like her uh, some of her staffers like it, this was such a painful uh, uh, political moment because it felt like family. Mm -hmm. What's up with what's up with like the family talk and the community talk? And I'm looking at you, Damage Magazine, Ben Fong. What's up with the family <laughs> in in yeah, corporate we need, America? Yeah, we need the Freudian explanation. Yeah, in the NG. Uh, but I mean, in all seriousness, like something that I really liked about your guys's piece is you point out at one point, or you know, it, it's just a line, but you say something like, "Go to any nonprofit website, and like within <laughs> 10 seconds of scanning it, you'll find some sort of invocation of community." Yeah. Um, and and we've addressed this like to a certain extent on on the show before. But um, what why what's with with the nonprofit fixation on community, and perhaps more importantly, like what does that obfuscate? Yeah, I I think that it's something that has I, I evolved over time for sure, um, and has at different points in time meant different things. And I think that you know, originally or not originally, but to kind of go back to the 60s, and, and this also, you can trace this thread back really to, to Herbert Hoover, um, there's this idea that part of what's wrong with social welfare and why we can't fix these systemic social ills is that our institutions are just not responsive enough to people. They don't, for whatever reason, they don't really know what's wrong with people's lives. And so therefore they come up with these clunky solutions, they don't administrate them well, and that's why we still have poverty. And so the notion of community was meant to signal this different approach to social welfare where administrators and organizers would be legitimately connected to the people um, and therefore actually be able to respond to their concerns. And, and this also, I mean, it connects so much back to the technocratic aspects that we talk about of NGOs because it's also connected to this idea that the reason that we still have systemic social rot is because we just don't know how to fix it. And if only we could give people the right information, then they would have it. And there's this idea that the community uh, which no one can actually define. And in, mm -hmm. in fact, is, is a highly political term that enables actors to, to define their own scope of action while pretending that actually they, they just found this community. Uh, and you know, there, there's some sort of organicness to the solutions that, that they've found because it's coming from the community. Um, so it, it, it allows people to posit that they're genuinely listening to people um, when in fact they're they're constructing their own plane on which to do political action, and and also through that process they're constructing who who is actually in charge of the community, and so it it allows um, you know nonprofit actors, but really almost anyone who uses this term. This is this is not even uh, nonprofits do love the term community, but this isn't a process that's specific to. NGOs, but it allows them to pick and choose who gets to speak for the people who they would like to say that they represent. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you ask um, activists today, uh, you know, why we use the word community so much, I imagine the standard answer would, would be to point to the community control programs of like the late 60s and to point to that as a, uh, you know, something that the left ought to emulate. And I, I think that there's sort of two, two problems with that. Um, one, and here I'd just sort of recommend 
uh, Karen Ferguson's Top Down, which is about the Ford Foundation. Um, the, the, the first thing is that the, those community control programs were co-opted by foundations and in a way that were, were um, you know, inimical to the aims of the community actors themselves. And so there's a sordid history there, but I think the bigger thing is that since then, um, the, the sort of largest uh, nonprofits and community organizations are uh, community development corporations. And these are typically organizations like, you know, embedded all over the country um, that are meant to, you know, get for-profit developers and, um, you know, community leaders in the same room to sort of like hash out uh, social issues. And the problem there, of course, is that the people who get represented in those organizations, which have the, uh, the sheen and the authenticity of the word community, are um, you know generally elites and not um, the people in the actual you know geographical uh, areas that they're supposedly uh, representing. Right. Well, so actually on that point, I mean, uh, I think there's so I guess there's two parts to this because the first is that um, community. I think you you guys kind of covered the previous question very well, but like there's this the community in the sense of like, oh, it's the people that I have relationships with and I know that are not in my family, they're in my neighborhood, we take care of one another, we look out for one another, something like that. And then there's just this very amorphous, the community. And there's people that fit into the community because of something that maybe they did, maybe they didn't do, maybe it's just some obscriptive identity thing and okay, you're now in the community. Um, what kinds of alliances does the NGO model of community building actually construct? And how are those different from the kinds of alliances that the left typically has built and wants to build? Yeah, so I think this is kind of another example where, where this is something that has, that has changed over time and has been argued about. But I would say where we are now is is kind of where we left off going into the 70s where um you know what the community is and what kind of alliances it it means is is the community is basically a series of groups that are represented by a leader and that that leader has the ability to articulate the concerns of the people and what a coalition is you know, what a community coalition is at this point is a group of leaders coming together and basically hashing out, you know, my my people want this, my people want this, let's come to some kind of compromise and say that this is what the community as a whole wants. And in practice, what that means is that often leaders are, are elites, are, you know, are, are people who have some kind of existing power or authority over localities to be able to assert themselves as a leader for various reasons, um, chiefly because they control community resources. And so in effect, what that does is it allows, you know, people who are already elites in their locality to, to um, posit that they're forming these grand alliances, which, you know, are, are basically cross-class alliances where actually elites are in complete control over what the coalition says and does. Um, and just to take that even a step further, you know, you can have someone who is a local elite, say, because they have a construction company and so therefore have some kind of ability to control development. But just because they have power in that community doesn't even mean that they will reasonably be able to assert their community's, you know, wishes over other sources of power, chiefly um, financing that comes from national or international banks. So it's not even it's not even a good method for local elites to control their communities against other more powerful elites. I mean, I think the short the short answer there is that community serves as a substitute for class that like instead of talking about mm -hmm. community, we should just talk about class, uh, which would much more uh, accurately, I think, represent political interests within any any supposed community. Um, just briefly, because I know Melissa probably doesn't want to talk about this, uh, but Kale, you asked about the psychoanalytic dimension. <laughs> yes, and let's do I, it. I think that there's something, there's something very appealing in community. I mean, uh, I think Eric, Eric Hobsbawm called community 
uh, one of those uh, vapid phrases of lost and drifting generations. And uh, I think that we, we hold on to community so much because it's not there, because we're highly atomized and we want a community. But the problem there is that, you know, capitalism is really good at recuperating languages that we like, languages of, of humanism. And, you know, those, uh, those love is love yard signs that you see around liberal neighborhoods, it's hard to disagree with all that stuff. That stuff is good, it's fine. Um, but the way in which it's used to justify a certain project, I think that's what's sort of pernicious about it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I was interrupting to ask if you own one of the signs. I, in this I, house, we believe. Yeah, <laughs> I do not have one of those signs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gotta um, do some so, more work. So I, I would, I want to shift gears just a little bit to talk about uh, whether there's an effective way for the left to work with nonprofits, because I think that we've sort of identified a lot of the pitfalls, um, but. Obviously, as we pointed out before, you know, a lot of people who are on the left work in nonprofits, right? Um, I myself have worked at nonprofits and at foundations in the past. Um, Jacobin, I think, is technically a nonprofit. Um, you know, organizations that we love, like Labor Campaign for Single Payer, um, you know, Labor Notes, I think that they're all nonprofits. Um, and again, I think that you're really clear in your work that, you know, you're not disparaging the work that these groups are doing, let alone the individuals who work for them. Um, but in thinking through some of these structural problems, do you guys see any way that we can smartly engage with nonprofits? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we, you know, whether, whether, whatever your opinion of nonprofits is, at this point, it is impossible to do any kind of political activity and not engage with, with some nonprofits. And part of that is because, you know, as we mentioned, it's really the, the structural constraints from nonprofits ultimately derive from funding structure. So there's plenty of nonprofits. I mean, well, plenty is maybe a stretch. There are nonprofits who are not funded by elite institutions. Um, and those are the ones that the left should prioritize working with. Um, and I think that, you know, DSA is kind of an interesting example of this, where DSA is a 501c3, it's a nonprofit, um, but it's funded by membership dues. And so that means that it, you know, even though it's, it's still a nonprofit, um, ultimately it's controlled by its members. It's controlled by the, by the people who, um, you know, volunteer for the organization. And the more kinds of nonprofits that we can seek out that are like that, um, the more successful the left will be at avoiding um, all these dynamics that, that cause conflicts with nonprofits' ability to actually confront the profit motive. The, uh, the, the coalition uh, around National Nurses United that's fighting for Medicare for All, I think, is a good example of this. Uh, NNU uh, convenes the table around which a lot of different organizations uh, exist, including the Labor Campaign for Single Payer. Uh, but there are a lot of nonprofits that uh, that are there, the Center for Popular Democracy, um, and so there. I mean, there 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 might be productive avenues of working with uh, you know nonprofit and, and union collaboration, um, provided that I think unions are in charge. That being said, I think that there is a tendency um, to channel a lot of the activism into you know the traditional nonprofit ways. So. Uh, you know, prioritizing insider lobbying, uh, prioritizing media campaigns, uh, social media campaigns, and uh, engaging in less confrontational tactics. So I think anytime you're dealing with nonprofits, they're going to want to uh, domesticate and channel any kind of, um, you know, dissent into avenues that they deem to be, uh, quote unquote, productive. All right, so we're going to do a little thought experiment. Imagine we're all sitting in the DSA meeting right now. Uh, just we're going to transport ourselves to, to, you know, it's the AC isn't working. It's really hot. It's it's it sucks. But I've actually been in those meetings like many times. This oh, is <laughs> oh, I know. That's that's why I know you you can do this thought experiment right now, Mel. If if the AC isn't working <laughs> in Phoenix and there's no meeting. <laughs> Okay, well, we're talking we're talking Brooklyn or something. We're not, which is still really hot. Coastal elites. Yeah, we're talking coastal elite DSA meeting. 
Uh, it's really hot, but the world is fucked. So we know that we have to do our part and we have to be there. Is the social justice language and the community talk and the localism, is all of this a problem for bringing new people into the room with us, particularly working class people? Because if I'm gonna suffer through the poorly ventilated DSA meeting, I wanna bring new people into this, that it's, it, it's not, I'm not doing this because it's fun. I'm doing this because it's politically necessary because we have a really horrific social circumstance right now. So is that, I think we should, I mean, my sense is that we should be fairly, um, uh, what's the word I want? Um, uh, mercenary about these things, right? That we have certain political goals and we need to do the things that help us get the, as close as we can to achieving those goals as possible. Are we shooting ourselves in the foot? Yeah, so I think that it is yes and no to your question. And what what's actually more pernicious about NGO language is that it is not 100% alienating because, you know, some of it, I, I was thinking about this a lot while you guys were, were talking during during your segment. And some of it is alienating and, you know, just straight up confusing. And some, you know, sometimes that has to do with terms that nonprofits just come up with and then expect everyone to know. Um, sometimes it's for really more boring technical reasons that the way that they want to talk about um, politics and society is in this just highly, highly specialized technical way that just no one, unless you have a master's degree, could, could possibly understand. But then a lot of it assumes the language of common sense. And, th and that's actually, I think, even more dangerous. And this, you know, some examples of this, I think, are NGOs emphasis on citizen engagement. Who would be against citizen engagement? You know, we we're people who talk about um, making structures more accessible, making it possible for um, citizens to genuinely participate in decision making. And so hearing a term like citizen engagement, it's not obvious why that's not compatible with the left. And in fact, on its face, it's not incompatible with the left. Right. And the problem is really is, is more so the way that these terms are then taken and then put through these routinized processes that are not only alienating processes, but are designed to completely disempower people and to make it clear that they're not actually, um, you know, they're basically doing the opposite of whatever the term is meant to invoke. And, you know, citizen engagement in the nonprofit world often means having some kind of public forum where all of the speakers are carefully picked out in advance because they represent a very specific viewpoint and then it's open to the public and citizens engage because they sit there and listen to people talk and that's what citizen engagement is and so on its face it's not bad but when you actually go through the process of how they conceptualize what citizen engagement is it's incredibly alienating because you realize this isn't engagement at all I totally agree with that and I think that's what's most pernicious about it that um, sure you know the the common features of like PMC language that we we all love to ridicule uh, can be quite alienating. But if anything, um, there has been a systematic investment in developing uh, public forum kinds of strategies that are non-contentious and friendly and inviting. Um, uh, the Ford Foundation was the sort of first to explicitly, you know, theorize political conflict in terms of like you know as like a sort of pre-modern impulse that needs to be be done away with. Um, but the Kettering Foundation, the Pooh Foundation, they've they've invested a lot in you know the so-called civic renewal movement, which uh, is about is specifically about developing um, strategies and tactics for putting on uh, public fora that lead to not debate but consensus. Uh, and you know they they take the the results of those meetings and they nicely package them for for, for city council representatives and whatnot. Um, but the whole point is to get rid of any kind of debate, is to get rid of any kind of conflict. And those kinds of spaces, when you first go, people are super friendly. I mean, nonprofit workers are super friendly at first. Um, and they're inviting and they, 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 are, they, they want to be so. Uh, and they, they, they don't want anything to get uh, too heated or for debate, for, for debate to get out of control. And so I think that the, the, the problem is not that 
it makes um, political spaces uninviting, but it makes them unproductive. You know, I mean, given the features of NGOism we we, we described earlier, um, there's going to be a, a systematic avoidance of uh, conflict and taking on uh, the the dominance of the profit motive. And given that. Um, the problem is not that it's an uninviting political space, but that it's going to ultimately be an unproductive political space uh, if you're talking about a left political space. Right. So different question. Um, what is the role of international NGOs? Is that any different mm -hmm. than what we've been talking about? So things like Oxfam or Doctors Without Borders, do they also fit into this critique? Yeah, they, they definitely do. And and we didn't talk about this as much in the piece, um, but there, I mean, there is a long history of, uh, you know, domestically, I would say sometimes it's more confusing. Abroad, it is almost blatant fuckery. I mean, there's no other, there's no other word to really describe. Um, I would say like, um, now, there's been a lot written about the the green revolution where there was a lot of nonprofit funding in experimenting with different agricultural methods abroad um, and effectively that was that you know in that case it's it's almost barely a nonprofit process it's it's so um, subordinated to for-profit um, capitalist motives but you know is called experimentation or demonstration um, so abroad it's almost more naked, I would say. I would guess the term NGOism is more familiar in the international context than, than the domestic. I think people tend to use the word nonprofit or, or foundation here um, to, to a lesser extent, third sector. Um, but we do focus in the article on um, on the domestic uh, scene, and you know, I mean, it's a huge it's a huge area for for research. Um, you know, in, in the intro of the article. We explicitly sort of bracket the international considerations. We also bracket the academic considerations, and that's a whole uh, basket that we're not going to get into. But uh, you know, in the early 20th century, foundations were very explicit about forming uh, you know a large variety of um, sort of pass-through organizations that are meant to influence academia, and they still exist, and they still give away a lot of money. Um, so there's there's a lot of things uh, in this sort of general. Uh, wheelhouse that we don't really explore. Yeah. Chen, you're muted. I do this every time. I was muted, I just, so I, I couldn't tell you you were you were also muted. Yeah, just just a chain of mutes. Um. <laughs> anyway, I I was gonna say you know I I want to end with just kind of a broader question. Um. And I don't think we'll get to the exact answer here tonight, obviously. Uh. But you know I think I think you've been really good about identifying like what we might call like the NGO trap, right? As we were saying, like these sort of structural con constraints that make NGOs basically pretty difficult to reform from the inside uh, or on a piecemeal basis. So, you know, what is the solution? Like, how do we break out of this mold? Um, how do we revive? I mean, I guess part of the answer is reviving mass organizations, right? And I know that's like a different, you know, a whole different segment or like a week's worth of segments. Um, but what are some kind of practical solutions uh, if you guys have any? I mean, should every leftist who's working for a nonprofit just quit and join a union or? <laughs> or should they form a union at the nonprofit? That just asked I am or Alice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it, it's a difficult question. And to go back to what we were saying at the beginning, um, we don't we don't want to make it seem like this is the problem for the left. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it is definitely an internal obstacle. Um, but the you know historic defeat of the working class is the problem that we're, we're dealing with. And this is um, a secondary problem. So I think it's best not to um, make Mm, I don't want to say that. It's, it's best not to, to uh, overly generalize about the nonprofit sector and think that any organization with um, a C3 or C4 status uh, should, you know, be excommunicated or something. Um, you know, the, the, the problem is both uh, more and less serious than that, I guess. Um, but just, you know, to, to address Jen, your question uh, about what, what to do about it, it wasn't that long ago that uh, we were pretty clear about what foundations were. Um, in 1916, 
uh, Rockefeller, the, the Rockefeller petitioned Congress to charter their uh, foundation, and they wouldn't do it. Uh, Rockefeller actually had to go to New York State to charter the foundation at first. And that should give you some sense of just how odious the Rockefeller name was. Uh, so, so much so, I mean, imagine Bill Gates going to Congress to charter his foundation and them saying, um, sorry, uh, you're a vile person and we want nothing to do with it, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a sea change in how we treat these things. And you, know, you, might, you might say, oh, well, that was 1916, that was a long time ago. Um, but as late, as late as the 1950s, uh, there were congressional hearings about the overreach of foundations that were supported on both sides of the aisle. And you read the transcripts of those hearings, uh, which unfortunately didn't really go anywhere politically. You read those transcripts and they're just as brutal. I mean, they saw foundations as a real threat to American democracy. And, and then, you know, beginning in the 50s and 60s, as, as foundation funders and activists became more cozy with one another, that kind of critique was, was lost. Uh, and we, we aren't, I think, as, as critical of uh, the foundations as we ought to be. So I think, I think part of it is just being clear like what this sector is and the ways in which it is undermining left politics. Yeah, and, and just to add to what Ben said, I think in a lot of ways, the growth of the NGO sector is so much a symptom of neoliberalization and the, the changes in our social welfare state. Um, and you know those changes are not just things that affect the structure of the state and of delivery of social goods, but it's also the fact that um, under neoliberalism, there is such an over accumulation of wealth that you know, people have billions of dollars to invest in these social initiatives that allow them even another degree away from their capitalist firm to control what society looks like and how it, and how it um, disperses and distributes its, its goods. So in a lot of ways, what this is the story of is, is another piece of why we need, um, you know, why we need a mass movement, why we need a strong state, why we need publicly owned and run institutions. But then on the other side, I think what's important about this story is that, you know, NGOs are here now and they're a huge sector of the economy. I mean, there millions of people are employed by NGOs. And so now as we're, we're trying to rebuild the left and, and think about, you know, how can we democratize society and how can we make sure that public goods are genuinely public goods? Now we have another layer of institutions with their own interests that, you know, don't necessarily want that to happen. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, it's something that it's, it's not as simple as looking back at the New Deal and saying, let's do that again and, and let's just create these public goods because they were really, you know, creating them. Now we have to figure out how do we contend with these additional institutions that have cropped up and are really not meeting social needs, but still have their own interests in existing. Right. And it's just what you're saying right now, kind of one of the things that struck me is just how compatible the, the like NGOism is with neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is basically just like, you know, uh, whole hog capitalism. It's like capitalism uninhibited to just, you know, it's, it's capitalism in the period of ripping apart the gains that working people won over the, you know, over the last 150 years. And so, to to try to have a different society to to build a, a new left to rebuild the labor movement and to rebuild the welfare state um and to effectively combat ngos and ngoism maybe not ngo but ngoism the fact that ng sorry is ambulance um ngoism um it you have to, it has to be an anti-capitalist perspective it has to be an anti-capitalist politics um it has to be a politics about uh working class power um, because that's how you got uh, the other uh, kind of social arrangement of having a welfare state, of having um, you know a greater standard of living for working class people. It didn't just come out of um, you know the the liberal do-goodery of the progressive era. Uh, it was uh, effectively class conflict, and so um, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe this is just an, an, you know an, an another question of it, like, do we have to do we have to basically go full 
class conflict in our politics, or can there be some something less? Do we even want something less, or or can there be something less um, uh, conflictual uh, that can mitigate the the effects of NGOism? Yes, class conflict. Yes. <laughs> cool. Uh, I just want to make sure it was said. It's Jacobin. I just just. It's a, good, it's a good Jacobin note to end on. Um, no, I, I, I think that there will always be plenty of people who are wanting to recuperate class conflict into a more positive direction. Um, you know, the, the progressives that uh, were oftentimes the architects of New Deal programs uh, were, I mean, way better than contemporary progressives. Um, but their, their hand was forced in a certain direction, and, they, and, and that was the sort of like key, key driver. So. I would uh, co-sign and say, um, yes, uh, the, the left should be about class conflict and, you know, the kind of um, uh, domestication of, of dissent that NGOs encourage. It's always going to lead in the same direction, which is a reaffirmation of the status quo. Yeah. So if you guys have like another two hours, uh, I wanted to talk to Ben about psychoanalysis and uh, and Mel, we, we have to finish discussing our Capital Volume 2 chapters. So we're gonna the do that live. The, the volume that everyone loves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And definitely reads cover to cover. That That's the content your viewers crave is <laughs> right. listening to Kayla and I read a paragraph of Volume 2 and just saying, what, what the hell's he doing here? I don't know. <laughs> it's probably about profit. And then it's afterwards, Kayla and I can talk about our dreams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have a good dream you can share, Ben, before we leave? Before Not you leave? Publicly. Okay. <laughs> so good dreams uh, that you will not hear. Um, thank you both so much. Uh, I really, I do want to stress like this, this new issue of Cattle. Here, let me, I'm going to give a little promo. The new Catalyst is really good and people should uh, buy it and subscribe to Catalyst. Um, and it's especially good because of the essay that Mel and Ben wrote. Um, people read that article and share it and uh, and then do better. That's that's a takeaway I want. <laughs> do better. Do better. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. All right, All right, take care, so have a good night. Bye. All right, fun. Um, I think actually we linked to their Catalyst article in the description box below. Um, so definitely give that a read. Uh, I thought that was a great discussion. Uh, they really hit on, you know, uh, I think everything that is sort of uh, problematic or just, again, the pitfalls of the nonprofit sector, which again, you know, they're really clear in their article, has nothing to do with the intentions of anybody involved in nonprofits, um, but it's a larger problem that unfortunately has sort of arisen in a moment when these, you know, once strong mass institutions, mass organizations uh, like, like, you know, labor unions, um, and even, you know, just large uh, uh, kind of uh, member organizations have been on the decline, so. I mean, even as they said, it, even though NGOs and NGOism isn't the primary problem that mm -hmm. the left or working people or anyone really faces right now, mm -hmm. um, it, it was honestly, and just from my experience reading it, like it was really useful and enlightening to, to understand effectively like why, uh, whether it be um, kind of how privatization has played out or um, just how, again, how ubiquitous this, uh, right. th this language and this, this worldview is mm -hmm. like just coded on everything. Um, it, it then helps to understand like, and think more analytically clear about like, okay, what, what are we up against? Who's our enemy? It's still capital, still the ruling class. Um, and to what extent is this uh, a actual, type of politics that it may or may not be inhibiting our political strategies and dealing mm -hmm. with and confronting the ruling class. Mm -hmm. um, so I found it really useful. Yeah. Uh, I hope you guys did. I hope if you're still watching an hour and 25 minutes into this, uh, I hope you appreciate it. Sorry, there is no psychoanalysis chat, but um, <laughs> to, to be continued. Um, yeah. So this was actually out of the scope of their article, so I didn't bring it up, but I also want to mention, because as I said, I, you know, worked for many years in the nonprofit sector. Nonprofits are like notoriously horrible places to work. And if you want to hear me tell a story about one of the nonprofits I worked at, look up a video I did with Walter Ben Michaels. Uh, mm. I think this was like, 
probably like a year ago or like over a year ago. Um, but anyway, they're they're nuts. <laughs> yeah. Damn, I was I thought we were about to get a story. Yeah, well, uh, let's save that for another time. <laughs> so so people aren't hanging on for two hours listening mm. to us complain about nonprofits. Um, but any last thoughts? Uh, on the mayoral race or on nonprofits, just to bring it full circle. Yeah. Um I don't know. I mean Who's your uh who what's your ranking? Number one, Curtis Sliwa. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um I might I might still write in Bernie Sanders number one just because because I because because you have to. Yeah. It, why it's not? gonna be Bernie Sanders, COVID-19, Stacey Abrams, <laughs> uh, yeah. and then I don't know, maybe I'll be serious in the last two. Yeah. Um it's it's pretty bleak. But you know, one day maybe it won't be. So <laughs> that's, that's also, by the way, note. because Jacobin is a nonprofit, we are not endorsing any political no. candidate, by the way. So yeah, I'm, I am not endorsing Bernie Sanders for mayor of New York City. <laughs> <laughs> never. All right. I mean, well, never. Um, thanks for watching, guys. And we'll see you next week. All right, have a good night.